morning, everyone. Welcome to Wellesley Church. We hope you enjoy the service this morning. It's a beautiful, sunny morning, a little, more, a little cooler, a little more refreshing, and it's just beautiful in the area, lots of green out there, and uh, with all the rain, you see all the crops being harvested already. So we'd like to welcome the folks that are watching on Zoom, as well as later on YouTube. Special welcome to all you folks. Announcements. Uh, anybody has an announcement, please come forward at this time. I think Jamie's coming up. I thought a leadership transition update would be appropriate this morning. Uh, in addition to what we've already shared with you, um, Matthew Bailey Dick's first Sunday with us will be September 22nd. And in addition to that, I thought you might like to know that he has found a house in Waterloo and will be moving uh, tomorrow and Tuesday. And um, Dan has graciously offered to pick up a plate of sandwiches for them to help them out. We asked if they needed help to move, and, and they said they had enough, uh, enough muscle, but um, a plate of sandwiches would be appreciated. So that's what we're doing. Um, uh, Paul's last Sunday with us will be September 15th. And we don't yet have plans made for how that service will look, but we will be getting on that very shortly. And um, yeah, beyond that, uh, we'll try and keep you informed as best we can. And if you have questions at any time, don't hesitate to ask. Um, I was planning to put this in the uh, info page for this week, but the week went faster than I did. I will try and I will try and get it in by next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie, and all of the people that served on that committee. Thank you very much. Any other announcements that anybody wants to make? We'll have a look at the info page. Please check that out. And I'd just like to highlight uh, this Tuesday morning, 8.30, is WMC's North of 60 breakfast at Schmitzville Restaurant. Come and enjoy good food and great fellowship. Contact Ross Schantz if you, for more information. And we've got another summer long weekend coming up in September. I believe it's September 1st. We'll be meeting here at Wellesley Church. So Pool and Cross Hill will be joining us here. And anything, I think if there's no other announcements, we'll go through the land acknowledgement. We give thanks for the first peoples who called this land home and for all the ways they cared for the land. We acknowledge with gratitude that we are worshiping on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Haudenosaunee and neutral peoples. As Anabaptists, we strive to walk in the ways of peace, reconciliation, and justice with all peoples and God's good creation. So at this time, we'll ask, we'll uh, calm our hearts and prepare for worship as Sandra plays the musical interlude. Thanks, Sandra.
For our call to worship, uh, I've chosen number 851 from Voices Together, and it'll be projected on the screen there. Jesus calls us to praise and prayer, to song and silence. Jesus calls us to worship. Jesus calls us to hearing and healing, to service and solidarity. Jesus calls us to Jesus calls us to advocacy and action, to protest and provision. Jesus calls us to justice. We hear the call of Christ. We worship together with joy. Let's pause for prayer. This is from Voices Together, paraphrased. Life-giving God. May your Holy Spirit inspire our praise and our prayers. Open our hearts and minds to your presence among us and within us. Come alive in our words and actions as we worship. In glory and blessing now and to the end of time. Amen. So I'll ask the song leaders to come forward at this time. Our first song for this morning is 496, I Owe the Lord a Morning Song. You're invited to stand in body or in spirit. Let's sing together. Honestly, long. Oh 
So I put the uh, sermon suggestion box aside and I slotted in a sermon on the series, an Old Testament sermon series whew, on Joseph for the rest of August. It is an ancient and also a current saga and it's striking how different and yet the same how our human condition remains and how honest the Bible is about our heroes of faith. It's also a case in point of how we treat the Old Testament differently than the New. We often say the Old Testament is descriptive, not prescriptive. In other words, it describes and it tells us what happened to people and it does not tell us to act the way they did. They did terrible things. And even concerning the laws in it, most of them, or Jesus repeatedly says, you have heard that it was said, he says something from the Old Testament, but I say unto you, and then he offers a New Testament corrective. And we often summarize that by saying we do not have a flat Bible. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament is above it. I used to say it trumps the old, but I don't like using that word anymore. <laughs> now, on to Old Testament jo Joseph and his difficult family saga. Long before there was the crown or reality TV. Long before there was The Young and the Restless or J.R. Ewing in Dallas, before there was TV or even radio or gossip columns in newspapers, there was drama. All kinds of drama. Intense family drama. And there were generations upon generations of people sitting around campfires telling long and intricate stories about things that happened in their family histories. And we look back and kind of think those people primitive because their world lacked almost everything that we take for granted. But listen to their stories and they re reveal a sophistication and a deep understanding of the primal elements of life that put our entertainment culture to shame. There is a reason why some of those stories at least have survived so long. There's a reason why they are treasured and remembered so well. They have things to say. Things not always noticed at first glance, but things that are deep and true and holy. That's certainly the case in the Old Testament stories we have that the Hebrew people have given us. And some of the most ancient of those stories are the Joseph stories. They're close to 4,000 years old were written down only about 3,000 years ago. They were kept orally for about 1,000 years, from one generation telling to the next generation to the next generation, for close to a millennium. Consider how remarkable that is. Think about having a family reunion, sitting around after supper, and talking about people who lived in the year 1,000 that were your ancestors. That's how remarkable it is, how precious these stories are. <coughs> There's more to them than we caught when we heard them first as children. Now, I loved Old Testament Joseph as a child. Thought I understood it quite well. I had older brothers. I knew exactly what Joseph was up against. There he is, wearing a nothing but hand-me-downs, gets one new coat, and everybody takes offense. <laughs> and I loved his dream those older brothers coming down and bowing down before him, and it came true for him, you know? Now, hearing that, you already have some ideas about my family of origin and what happened there. And these stories are a bit like that. You tug a bit at one corner, and there's a thread that spools off, and it reveals dynamics that are so very interesting and might even be therapeutic, or maybe just confounding. And we'll do that kind of study, tugging these next weeks, this next month, as we go through the Joseph soaps. They take up much of the book of Genesis. Today, we'll take a family history tour, go back a few generations to see what happened there. And I've got a, an extended scripture reading that I've asked Gerald to read with me. So Gerald, please. From Genesis 27, 
When Isaac had become an old man and was nearly blind, he called his eldest son Esau and said, My son, I am an old man and might die any day now. Go out into the country and get me some game. Then fix me a hearty meal, the kind that you know I like, and bring it to me to eat so that I can give you my personal blessing before I die. Rebecca, that's Isaac's wife, was eavesdropping. And as soon as Esau had left, she spoke to her son Jacob. I just overheard your father talking with your brother Esau. He said, bring me some game and fix me a hearty meal so that I can eat and bless you with God's blessing before I die. Now listen to me. Do what I tell you. Go to the flock and get me two young goats. Pick the best. I'll prepare them into a hearty meal, the kind that your father loves. Then you'll take it to your father. He'll eat and bless you before he dies. So he went out and got them and brought them to his mother, and she cooked a hearty meal, the kind his father loved so much. Then she took Esau's clothes and put them on Jacob and covered his hands with goatskins. Jacob took the meal to his father and said, My father. Yes, Isaac said. Which, which son are you? Jacob answered, I am Esau, your firstborn. Isaac said, uh, Come close, let me touch you. Are you really my son Esau? He pressed him again. You're sure you're my son Esau? Yes, I am. Finally, Isaac blessed him. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. He made him an elaborately embroidered coat. When Joseph's brothers realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him. Joseph had a dream. When he told his brothers, I hated him even more. Listen to this dream I had. We were all out in the field gathering bundles of wheat. All of a sudden, my bundle stood straight up and your bundle circled around it and bowed down to mine. His brothers hated him more than ever because of his dreams and the way he talked. His brothers had gone off to Shechem where they were pasturing their flocks, their father's flocks. Jacob told Joseph, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are doing and bring me back a report. The brothers spotted Joseph off in the distance. By the time he got to them, they had cooked up a plot to kill him. When Joseph reached his brothers, they ripped off the fancy coat he was wearing, grabbed him, and threw him into a cistern. Then they sat down to eat their supper. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites on their way from Gilead. Judah said, Brothers, what are we going to get out of killing our brother and concealing the evidence? Let's sell him to the caravan. They sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who took Joseph with them down to Egypt. They took Joseph's coat, butchered a goat, and dipped the coat in the blood. They took the fancy coat to their father and said, We found this. Look it over. Do, do you think it's your son's coat? Jacob recognized it at once. He tore his clothes in grief and mourned his son a long, long time. Thank you, Gerald. A number of years ago, I had an interesting conversation with a man I'll call George, who was a bit younger than me, a conversation that left me shaking my head in wonderment. At the beginning of the conversation, I thought George was single. But as we talked, he mentioned a daughter. So I asked him about his marital situation. He would have been about 30 at the time. Well, he told me he wasn't married and he wasn't really divorced either. But he had been in a common law relationship with a woman for a number of years and they had a daughter together. They separated and the daughter lives with her mom. And then George went on to explain how thankful he was 
for how the situation had turned out, and they actually related very well to each other. He was on friendly terms with his ex. He got to spend a lot of time with his daughter. In fact, he said, they do holidays together. The five of them had gone camping the past summer. Five of them? Well, yeah, turns out George's ex has another man in her life and has another daughter with him. So that man, plus George, plus George's ex, plus the two daughters, all went on a family camping holiday together. Sprained my brain trying to imagine that. George told me it worked out rather well. It didn't occur to me until later that this situation was sounded so weird to me was actually quite Old Testament. George's camping family wasn't all that different than the families of the Old Testament patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, down to Joseph in particular. And then sometime after that, it dawned on me that just like Joseph, George, his situation was generations in the making, but just like George, like Joseph, George was a bright spot in that family pattern. He was working on change for the better in his generational picture. I had this conversation with George at his grandmother's funeral. I'll call her Anna. Anna was a longtime widow. She was a little bit on the edge of church life. I didn't get to know her very well until she had terminal cancer. Then we visited often, had deep conversations about faith, but not so much about her family. They all seemed kind of far away. Then one afternoon when I was there, I went out of the house and Anna's brother showed up. And he took me aside on the yard and he filled me in on some sad details of her life. Turns out, Anna's husband had cut her out of the will when he had died decades earlier. I don't think he could do that now, but they could then. He had made specific arrangements to make sure Anna did not get any money from the estate. Now this was not a rich family, but there was money there to be had. And that money was left for the kids when they got older. Anna was not allowed to touch it. She was left to slug it out, get a job, and raise their six children on her own. And that's what Anna and her children suffered under. Those are the perverse family values those children had thrust upon them. How would they ever learn what healthy marriage and family life was like? I knew George's fam uh, parents were divorced. I think he was in contact with only one of them. Now these dynamics are complex. A lot of factors involved in these kind of things can't just be explained in a minute or three. And many with such problems have, you know, many other things to blame, including their immaturity, not previous generations. But as far as I could tell, George's relational difficulties go back at least two generations. There was Anna's rotten marriage, George's parents' failed marriage, George not getting married and then being separated. And then for George's daughter, how would she ever get to experience healthy family life and good family values. To find relational soundness in her life would mean going against the weight and momentum of at least three generations. Which brings Exodus 20 verse five to mind about the sins of the parents being visited upon the third and fourth generation. That generational dynamic hits closer to home than we'd like to confess. Starting from Adam and Eve on down, there's something of that rottenness growing in each of our family trees. It's part of the human condition. The good news is you can trim those rotten branches out. You can trim them back, you can break the chain, you can vict win the victory over that kind of inheritance. It's not easy, but I think that's what George was trying to do for his daughter and for himself. He was doing the hard work of making things as okay as he could in his unusual blended family. It's an uphill battle. It's the road less traveled. But I've seen some families that appear to have done it well. This is the long, hard journey Joseph is on in the book of Genesis. There's good news coming. It's pretty far away, and we won't get to it today. Today we'll look back a couple of generations and see what Joseph was up against, 
and notices rottenness in his family tree, which looks from the outset to be quite noble. Because it starts with Abraham, his great-grandfather, goes to Isaac, his grandfather, and then to Jacob, his father. These are the pillars, the patriarchs of the Old Testament faith stories, and we like to think they had great marriages and wonderful family life. But that's not what the Bible tells us. It's clear the opposite was true. Now, there are lots of good stories about these men. We've heard them a lot. They aren't the focus for today. Today, we acknowledge that the things, some of the things they did in their families were horrible, things that would land them in jail in our day and age. Their family life is like a sordid soap opera, complete with lying and cheating, incest and polygamy, prostitution, threats of murder, and selling a sibling into slavery. Everything from child abuse to elder abuse. It's a miracle God didn't write these guys off. So God can make something of us too, right? Consider Abraham. Before he and Sarah, his wife, had their son Isaac, Abraham has a son Ishmael with Sarah's maid, Hagar. Understandably, Sarah cannot stand Hagar. Mistreats her so badly that Hagar and Ishmael flee into the desert. They return, but then after Isaac is born, Sarah and Abraham's son, Abraham sends Hagar and Ishmael out into the desert to fend for themselves, presumably to die. But God rescues them. What Abraham did, far, far worse than what George's uh, grandfather did. The next generation isn't much better. Isaac and Rebekah have twins. They each pit their favorite, and then they pit those favorites against each other. Terrible parenting. Makes you wonder what that marriage might have been like, eh? The scripture reading was a condensed version of how Rebecca and her favorite son Isaac team, again, team up against her husband, blind old... No, Rebecca and her favorite son Jacob team up against blind old Isaac and his favorite son Esau. And they swindle the primary blessing out of Isaac and take it away from Esau to put it onto Jacob. And after that, Esau says, I will kill my brother Jacob. Don't imagine they had a lot of family reunions, right? <laughs> Jacob takes off, runs for his life to Uncle Laban. Uncle Laban is part of this family that switches in identities and swindles people. So he wants to marry Rachel works seven years for her, but after the wedding, he finds out that Uncle Laban slipped Leah in behind all those veils, and he's married to the wrong woman. He needs to work another seven years for Rachel. So that's the start of all kinds of hostilities, rivalries, and indiscretions between those sisters, their maids, and Jacob. Jacob ends up having 12 sons, six by Leah, Two by his favorite wife, Rachel, that's Joseph and Benjamin. Two by Rachel's maid, Bilhah, and two by Leah's maid, Zilpah. Kind of makes George's family of five seem rather tame, doesn't it? Small wonder that these 12 sons of Jacob didn't get along. Joseph, one of the younger ones, the one the others loved to hate because Joseph, Jacob picked him as his favorite, gave him that special coat. And picking favorites would be one of those rotten family values he picked up from his parents. And then to add fuel to the fire, Joseph flaunts his favorite status, his favored status, spouts off about his dream, his whole family bowing down before him. And in his adolescent ignorance and arrogance, he might have been so spoiled that he doesn't know that others hate him all the more as he proclaims his immature superiority. And it gets worse. Father Jacob appoints young man Joseph as supervisor over his older brothers and sends Joseph to go out and check on them. And that's the breaking point. The brothers see him coming and plot to kill him, just like Uncle Esau plotted to kill the favorite son one generation earlier. And the parallels continue. Jacob, who once used Esau's clothes to trick his father, is now tricked himself by his own son. They use Joseph's clothes to convince him that Joseph is dead. 
Joseph brother, Joseph's brothers see a caravan of Ishmaelites coming. Remember Ishmael, that's their distant cousin from Hagar. Then they sell Joseph to them. Dip Joseph's coat in special goat's blood, show it to their dad, trick him into thinking a wild beast has killed his favorite son, which causes him great grief. So that's as far as we'll go with Joseph today. I wonder what's been going through your heart and mind as I've been talking about him and George and their families. Maybe it reminded you of something sad in a family that you know. There is pain in every family. Sometimes it is severe, and sometimes it can stretch back for generations. That's the bad news. It's as old as the Old Testament. It's as ugly as sin. But we're not halfway through the story yet, and bad news isn't all there is. The good news comes later. And if God can, you know, establish a saving faith out of such a mess, there's much God can do with each of us and our family dysfunctions as well. And the really good news comes in Jesus. The really good news tells us that we are each God's favorite tells us that Jesus rose from the dead to free us of all oppressive power, tells us that everyone is welcome to stand on the same level ground at the foot of the cross. No one gets sent out in the wilderness to die. No one gets tossed under the bus. No one gets to lord it over anyone else. We are individually, equally, highly valued and loved by the supreme power of the entire universe in spite of whatever burden our lives, our family history might place on us. Our primary calling is to follow Jesus. And when we heed our primary calling, we can be empowered to break free of dysfunctional patterns. Joseph did it. It wasn't easy on him, but he did it. And I think George was doing it. And I wonder what's been happening in that family circle these intervening decades. And we are all called and empowered to do the same. It is a lifelong task. And Jesus promises to stand with us and guide us forward as we stumble along. Let us pray. <coughs> Loving Lord, we thank you for your word your word that is honest and blunt about our fallenness, about people you loved dearly, who fell so very, far, so very far short of your call upon each of us. And we recognize ourselves, our situations and their stories. Assure us of your grace when we fail. Assure us of your strength when we deal with difficulty. Assure us of your guidance when we struggle and grant us hope along the way, hope for healing and joy, hope for love to find a way to grow, hope for things to get better, even if they look different than we would have wished. We pray in the name of the one who conquered death itself, Jesus the Christ, amen. We'll continue worship through singing together. Our next hymn is number 718.
So it's time to give thanks for our offerings. The offerings are, the plate is at the back there, so feel free to uh, put your offering in there. At this time, we'll have a, our offering prayer. God of life, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for all our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing that you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts and open hands. Amen. So last week, we missed the uh, congregational celebrations jar. We had that at Cross Hill, and I think quite a number of you were at Cross Hill and shared that. But if anyone missed that, now is your chance to uh, come forward and uh, say what things you're thankful for or celebrations that you have. We're celebrating our sixth wedding anniversary today. <laughs> We're celebrating our anniversary today. Any others? I don't see anyone else rushing up here. If not, uh, Dan is going to uh, have our congregational prayer at this time. He's welcome to come up too. <laughs> I like people. Um, two things before the congregational prayer. First of all, that uh, sermon you gave today made Yellowstone look uh, really easy. So I can only imagine what Hollywood would have done with that whole story. Um, uh, and second of all, with the celebration jar, I was thinking <clears throat> this morning when I saw it here that we should all have a little celebration jar on our counter at home because during the week, I'm sure there's celebration times that, that we're thankful for and then when we get to the big one, we forget it. But I know through the week, um, there's many things I'm thankful for and I think we should all set a little jar aside and drop coins in as we as we think of those things, so. But thank you for the message this morning. I'm kind of dizzy after all that, so. <laughs> Join me in uh, congregation prayer today. <clears throat> Good morning, God. Thank you for the many blessings you have given us this past week. We sometimes seem so unworthy of these blessings. Thank you for the freedom to worship here this morning, be with our many members who may be away or traveling. God, as we've watched the Olympics this week, we've witnessed some unbelievable athletic feats. We've watched many individuals and teams achieve their goals. We have also witnessed those who have fallen sh a bit short. We have witnessed the joy of victory as well as the agony of defeat. And in all this, we are reminded of the words in Isaiah 40, 40, 30 to 31. We recognize that our spiritual lives are much like the lives of athletes. We strive, we read, we pray, we train, and work to be good people and good Christians but sometimes we fail and miss the mark. It hurts when we don't attain or maintain our Christian values or goals, and we know the athletes trained and are trying to achieve their goals and to be the best, but it sometimes just comes, just does not happen. Similarly, we be, sometimes we get tired and worn down and we miss the mark of being a good Christian. God, forgive us for this. It's not like we didn't try, we just came up short. In all this, we cling to the words in Isaiah, we are human, and we may grow weak and stumble. And yes, even the strongest, strongest, strongest of us, we, may, we find hope and are re-energized by verse 31, where we are taught that when we wait on the Lord, pause and listen, we can get new strength and rise up like eagles and run and not get weary, walk and not grow weak. Thank you, God, for this reminder. God, we thank you for the many ways you have stood by our members who have been sick, suffered some ailment, or are waiting for upcoming medical procedures. We thank you for the healing you have allowed to happen in those of our immediate and church family. 
We know and thank you for being all-knowing and caring for even the unspoken needs and ailments. May you grant patience and hope for those who may be struggling with sickness, ailments, or pain. We especially ask that you be close to those who are dealing with the loss of a loved one. Give them strength and hope. <clears throat> we continue to lift up our leaders, whether locally, provincially, nationally, or internationally. Give them all wisdom and integrity as they do their job. May they recognize the authority they have and use it wisely. We thank you for continuing to bless the ongoing work here at Wellesley Mennonite. We thank you for blessing us with many great pastors in the past, and we thank you for our current pastoral leadership in Claire and Paul. Give them strength and wisdom as they serve here at Wellesley. We look ahead to the fall, and we are joyful for the way you have led Matthew to us. We ask that you would be with Matthew and Nina as they plan their move back to Waterloo this week. Thank you for the many ways you've held this congregation together and for granting many gifts to the members here. We also lift up our households of faith, households of faith this week. God, thank you again for the many gifts you've given us. Thank you for the many ways we see and experience your presence in nature and in relationships. Like an athlete, help us as Christians to wait on you so we can run and not grow weary, walk and not get weak, and help us to continue to strive to meet the goal of being a good Christian person. In all this we ask, amen. Ask the musical team to come forward again. Our final hymn for today is 743, just a closer walk with thee. Let's stand to sing and we'll remain standing for the benediction afterwards. <coughs> I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone that took part this morning and everyone that is here and uh, Paul yeah I thought we had a lot of drama these days but uh, it started way back then and goes on and on there is please stay for our fellowship and there's coffee and tea and some snacks there and at this time we'll have the closing benediction May the God who sustained the patriarchs thousands of years ago also sustain us and reveal to us meanings in scripture meant for us today. 
Go in peace. Peace.